Okay, I'm Simon Gilby, and um, I'm the maker of this exhibition, The Syndicate, that's been touring around Australia. And I want to explain to you that I'm not normally in this state, but a motorcycle accident, which makes me look strangely like some of the sculptures that I've made here. But um, just to uh, make mention of the people who have supported this exhibition, the exhibition's called The Syndicate because it ended up uh, being organised uh, to have a syndicate of collectors, they were art collectors interested in my work um, previously, most of them, and they put in a share each um, to end up with an artwork. So there was a great deal of trust involved in that because I told them that they couldn't expect a particular artwork, they didn't have any creative control. I told them that I'd be making life-size works about, uh, I guess, the human condition and the obsessions I'd previously um, worked with in other work. Um, but I really couldn't promise them anything else. So I really appreciate that level of trust. And of course that freed me up from trying to get other income in teaching or labouring or whatever and gave me a full year and a half or nearly two years working, I would say, obsessively on these works. Um, I'm very proud of the work and I'm very grateful to those people. Now that um, syndicate was primarily organised by an extraordinary man, Lloyd Horn, who has a major collection in Western Australia and uh, supported the whole project. And I'd like to let you know also that the syndicate continues now with another West Australian sculptor of real note, uh, Peter Daly. I think I became um, a sculptor, if that's what I am now, just in a way, it was about the, the broadest possible um, job description in a way. I really liked making stuff. And um, it seemed that most of the other paths of um, occupation seemed pretty narrow to me and, and, and I was interested in stuff that was quite mysterious. Um, I guess art means that I can explore stuff that I don't know kind of what I'm doing. And even with my students I, I tell them that it's almost, it's a profession of being lost all the time. It's one that uh, whenever you feel you've got something worked out you're in the wrong spot. Um, so for me it was about the love of making and expressing ideas through that. To make each of these works roughly took about, uh, I guess, two months or so each. And sometimes there's um, a lot of dead ends that I went down that were costly time-wise. Uh, the, the process starts with an idea and often it's just a simple drawing in my drawing book. And then I'm sort of trying to work out how they connect with the, the ruminating kind of thoughts that I'm um, having at the time. So after that design development, it really comes down to um, making three-dimensional that idea. So as you can see, the, the works are made of um, sheeted steel. It's almost like making a patchwork of, of, it's kind of like boys patchwork really. It's like little bits of steel, welded seams, and then Sometimes the seams are polished or um, coated, and sometimes they're left with the, um, the welding marks, almost like scars. And the metal uh, that's used in this um, exhibition was kind of deliberate. Uh, I feel like the show's a bit of an end of enlightenment kind of exhibition, where metal welding is now a um, pretty traditional and almost outmoded form. Um, it harks back to more like Second World War stuff and sometimes the figures look like um, welded hulls, that kind of stuff. I guess one of the examples of how I made the works is Architect, which I think you can see over my shoulder at the moment. And um, that work was made uh, with the sheeting of the steel um, and it's also got an etched um, surface of the spine and nervous system running down from the neck of the figure down to the base of his spine. That work was really um, wanting to make kind of like a patriarch uh, and it's based a bit on uh, growing up with my own father who was a um, thoroughly decent man who worked as an engineer, went to church on Sunday and, uh, and had all the um, expectations of his, uh, his society um, that things would be good and things would get better if you work harder and that technology would deliver solutions to all of the problems of the world, which it had for many, many years. Um, and his faith would um, 
provide better and better things in the world. And I guess I was wanting to make an image of someone who had done that very same stuff um, and maybe arrived at a point of doubt or a, a very reasonable um, self-inquiry. So he was made um, just by sheeted steel and it was deliberate that he would look a little bit like a um, sea mine or something, something that looks like it's going to explode. He's kind of doubled over and you can decide whether that's sort of some kind of angst or, or whatever. And he's looking at his hands. Um, and to me, hands are significant in, significant in terms of being the primary tools of the way we manipulate the world. So his hands are the ones that have done all of the good work. Um, and he's looking at them and inquiring of sort of what they've been worth. Um, and on his head, there's also that um, geometric kind of framework, which you'd see as a bit of a cage. And I guess that clear linear ge geometry uh, is hoping to evoke an idea of that very rational way of approaching the world. Kadu is a work that um, is a bit of a, a twin with the architect that I've just talked about. And um, as much as it's the architect was referencing my dad, um, or more so, the Kadu figure kind of talks a lot about my mum. Uh, my mum's <coughs> family <coughs> grew up and opened up the town of Kadu, which is a little way from Perth, about oh, 250 k's away. And um, in the span of her life, which she's about 76 now, um, they cleared the land close to when she was born. And now, at well, you know, at the ripe old age of 76, that same land is pretty much toxic. And... Um, and saline, pretty hard to grow anything there. So it's it's really the story of, um, I guess, that extraordinary situation where once again you get thoroughly decent people me misreading the play environmentally. So in that work, there's a um, a, uh, a really strong-looking figure, I like to think, um, and she's covered with a a sand uh, sand that came from around the homestead where my mum was born. We went out there on a trip, and on the trip uh, that we made out there, we were just going through a desolate landscape, which is kind of referenced in the twigs and things that come out of the, um, the sticks that are holding the figure up. And we went through washouts um, where there hadn't been any water run through them for years and years and years, but there were still those kind of tragic looking um, depth, depth gauges either side of the road. Uh, also, along the way, we found one dead bird, and um, <laughs> so I picked it up and put it in the back of the ute, and they were cast for the for the kind of desultory uh, wings for that figure. And the um, the sand, as I was saying, that was at the base of the um, the chimney, which was the original house where the original house was, I used to flock the um, surface of the figure with a William Morris prints print. Um, may well know it was someone who really regarded the natural environment as trying to re-engage people sort of after the um, industrial revolution to see beauty in the everyday once again. And um, so that European design is, um, is the design that covers her skin with the sand from her homestead. This work is um, called Messiah, which actually ends up being a bit of a pun on the um, artist friend that I used as a model for this, which I won't identify. But um, I, I've always thought just how much being a sculptor and a figurative sculptor, I've really loved the, um, the figurative sculptures of totalitarian regimes, which has had me feel very nervous about my own politics, just in terms of how come I love all these fascist and um, uh, socialist kind of images when they're associated with so, so many horrors. In this case, um, there's a beautiful um, hymn, which is the Internationale, which is, of course, the um, Russian national anthem and I think the Chinese national anthem, which is a beautiful hymn, quite separate to politics, um, but just talks about a heroic idea of humanity, which I love and I believe in, in actual fact. So I've cast, I've um, etched that onto the surface of a large sheet of steel and I've printed it, and the figure um, has a wheelchair going through it and I guess that was just wanting to twin such a heroic image with a sense of um, without disrespect to anybody a sense of 
of brokenness, of flawedness, which I guess uh, is an opinion that I, I, I have. When we are in our greatest positions of power, it's often when we're at our worst, I think. This is a work um, called Tarboy, and I might just take the opportunity to talk about how um, I use the body, obviously, very literally in some circumstances, but I make changes to it. So you can see that the figure's got really um, quite realistically rendered mouth, open mouth and teeth, and yet there are no eyes. And if you see around the room, you won't find any actual eyes. Um, and I guess all of these figures I see as internalised in a state of um, inward reflection, or it's really you're getting a moment of real kind of voyeurism where you're looking at those people I imagined in a darkened room or um, with their, their cognition really moving inward. So it's the case with this figure too. And the little hands being um, separated and uh, on hinges, for me it's about, um, there's a, hands for me are the things that I control or manipulate my world with, um, of course being a, a sculptor. And I guess that, that sense of there being a disconnection, I've got one right now, in fact, um, talks about a lack of um, a lack of ability. The time for making or doing or manipulating stuff is stopped. This is about stillness. It's not about doing. Um, and even maybe in this case, it's about uh, a kind of inability to do. This is a work based on my son, and um, and also myself at around the same age. And about that anxiety that I have for my son in a world that's uh, got some really serious questions about the future. So this figure is um, in fact covered with bitumen. It's a, a petrochemical product. Um, and down on the base, his shadow is um, described by the bitumen road surface. For me, when I was growing up, I lived at the outskirts of the city. I wanted to play in the bush and um, because we were on the edges of the suburbs, it seemed like my culture was about bulldozing the bush and laying bitumen over it. Um, and I can remember the first rains in after summer where you had that really pungent smell of bitumen, which seems to be the underpinning, the petrochemical kind of underpinning of our, our whole society. And to me, a very perverse attitude to landscape, say in contrast to the Aboriginal people who saw that landscape replete with um, story and meaning. Uh, this is a work called Finalist, and um, I guess like many of the works, and it sounds dreadfully grim, but uh, that sort of trying to find for human meaning through different belief systems uh, has really kind of obsessed me a bit. Um, and yeah, the idea of life after death, or even a power greater than yourself, as in what happens when we adhere to, say, a belief system like a religion. Um, when I was a kid, I saw the huge whale skeleton in the uh, West Australian Museum, and I was impressed by how beautiful it was and how tragic it was. Um, it was a huge three-ton chunk of dead animal. Um, and for me, whales somehow in their benign kind of floating around in the ocean became a symbol of mortality and maybe God, an idea of something bigger than yourself. And of course, there's the idea of um, Jonah and the whale. And I was thinking about a finalist in terms of a figure who is um, like Jonah, biblically, is asked to do something that's counter to what they would do by their own volition. Jonah gets stuck in a whale for three days and thereby convinced to do what God wants him wanted to do. And uh, it connected up to um, lots of the ideas around the uh, suicide bombers and, and the demonising of them at that time. And I was thinking about, well, if God has told someone to do something as horrendous and horrific as that is, where is their responsibility if there is a belief in something that's the afterlife and, and, or a God? And it seems that um, that idea of God's quite alien to our Western culture. So it's a difficult work. I really like the work. And I think that lots of the work I make is about the difficulty of being a human being, meaning and belief. So yeah, the finalist really about that final moment and the moment of testing if there is an afterlife or not. So this is a work called Confinement, and um, people might remember that confinement was used as a term for that period when um, women were about to give birth or soon after, and there was a time of sort of keeping them away, um, although maybe for, except for female members of family and, 
and female friends. Um, my own experience and my pa partner's experience of having a kid was a really strange one in our society where there wasn't really an obvious place for her kind of womanhood being pregnant. She was no longer um, a single girl, um, you know, getting out and doing the kind of fun things she might do with um, other friends. And also she didn't have a child, so she wasn't part of the mother's club. Um, it was just me thinking about how our society deals with that extraordinary um, transitional time for a woman. So in this case, I like to think of the figure as like a satellite floating in space. Once again, there's bitumen down on the bottom as a, a kind of shadow. Um, so that might be the Earth. She's checkered like they used in the 60s um, space hardware. And there's um, mobile phone towers and stuff. I guess looking like part of a, a satellite, but also I'm really interested in how our, our cities are now populated above the roof line with um, so many mobile phone towers seemingly yearning for meaning and just overwhelmed with information. So all these things seem incredibly worked out, but of course those things happen in the process of making them. Um, and I get a lot of time in the studio doing it. So. Um, and I'd like to say that any of the interpretations you have are at least as valid and more so, in fact, because of your own story when you meet the story that I've um, turned into a sculpture. I particularly uh, wanted to talk about the work you can see just behind me here, um, because I guess it's one of the works I feel that's most successful and emblematic of a lot of the um, ideas in the overall show. Uh, it's called Corpus, which of course means a body of work. You'll hear that about bodies of music or um, bodies of uh, literature, I suppose. And it's a bit of a pun in terms of this figure being a physical body um, or, or, or an idea of that anyway. The work, in a way, came from that initial image of the um, downed airman, the American airman in Darfur, where he was dragged through the streets. And a lot of these works reference things of conflict where there's clashes of religion or philosophy. Um, inquiring about uh, how we live and, and meaning. In this one, the figure is articulated, so to move it around, it's, it's like uh, a corpse. Um, it's like a big sort of grotesque puppet. But at the same time, it's uh, decorative, I guess attempting ideas of conventional beauty. And um, inside the figure, which of course is a corpse as much as it's a corpus, um, the skeleton is contained in each of the sections or segments of the body. So there's the skull inside the head and rib bones in the chest, etc. Um, on each of the bones, I've etched um, text from different ideas that people have died from, from manifestos to the, very, um, the various religious tracts of the Quran and the Bible, Jewish tracts, etc. But the Communist Manifesto and even cheekier things like uh, my son inscribed some immortal words of, of Darth Vader. But quite seriously, it's really about what we leave behind and the idea of reliquaries, the idea that um, if we do pass as a physical thing, is there something left behind? I shall think the show, this show has been traveling since two, the end of 2009. And um, it was supported by uh, Art on the Move initially in my state where it had about five different showings there and then um, it's been along the east coast um, Melbourne Townsville and now Sin Sydney as the last showing which is great it's really glad to see it here really beautifully put together and um, looking forward to see how people respond to it